Okay, we're going to play around with some inverse functions, and we're going to start with a quick review of writing the equation of a linear function. So I would like to calculate the equation of line AB, given the fact that the point A is negative 4, negative 3, and the point B is 6, 2. I'm going to do this a little bit differently than what your typical algebra teacher shows you. I'm going to draw a mapping, and I'm going to pair the point negative 4 with negative 3. I'm also going to pair the point 6 with 2. And these are my x values here, these are my y values here. Should make pretty good sense. And I'm looking for the equation of the function that will allow me to send a negative 4 to a negative 3 and to send a 6 to a 2. And there's only one linear function that does that, and we are going to find the equation for that linear function. So over here, I'm looking at this thing, and the first thing that comes to my mind is I want to ask myself, how do I go from a negative 3 to a positive 2? And that answer is that I need to add 5. Now some of you are saying, how do you even know that that's what you need to do? And you're right, because I forgot to say that in order to write the equation of the line, we need to first find the what? And I hope you're saying slope, because that's what we need. So the slope of this line is going to be the change in the y values divided by the change in the x values, with you know that as y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, but I don't like that formula, so I'm not going to use it. Instead, I decided to draw a mapping of my relationship. And this right here, these are my y values, and this is how I go from negative 3 to a positive 2. This becomes my change in y, and I'm automatically going to know, I'm going to know the numerator of my slope right here. Over here, I have to maintain the same order that I chose with the negative 3 and the positive 2. So since I went from negative 3 to positive 2, I must go from negative 4 to positive 6. How do you go from a negative 4 to a positive 6? You have to add 10. So this becomes my change in the x values. I end up with a positive 5 over a positive 10, and that answer reduces down to 1 half. And what have I found? I have found the slope. The slope of the line that connects those two points, or contains those two points as well. Now, I'm going to choose to use something called the point slope I am going 
going to connect these two points. I, I have a little bit of a gap in the middle here and I kind of would like to have a point in there in order to connect, make it nice and smooth so I don't go off a little bit. So I'm going to just pick a zero here and decide where zero goes. So half of nothing is nothing and then minus one is negative one. The zero negative one is actually my y-intercept and it looks like it is, right? This is your b and y equals mx plus b form. So negative one is my is my y-intercept. I hope I said y-intercept a second ago. Seems to me like I can almost remember saying something else. But zero negative one is going to be right here. Zero negative one. So now I think I can go ahead and, and draw the line that's going to go right through those points. This is the equation f of x equals 1 half x minus 1. And I think that's very logical. It looks like 1 half x minus 1. I'm looking at a y-intercept of negative 1, and it does appear that I'm going up 1 over 2, up 1 over 2, up 1 over 2. So I've convinced myself that I have the right equation. So yay, good for that. The equation of the line that connects A and B here is going to be f of x equals 1 half x minus 1. All right, so I'm going to erase this, and I'm going to see if and how we can create some kind of an equation that would bring all of these numbers over here that are in the, do the range of my function f back into the domain of my function f. This is the domain of f of x, this set. This is the range of f of x. And I'm going to lowercase that. But when I want the function down here to go backwards, I'm going to call this g of x. When I want the function to go backwards, then this set that's over here on my right, which used to be the range of f of x, is going to become the domain of g of x. Which means that all these numbers are my input values to the function g. Which means, in a sense, that these values over here are now become the x's for g of x. And over here, this is where g of x will land, so this is going to be the range of my g of x function, and basically the y values that you get after you plug in an x value into the function g. They're the outputs. Input to g, output to g. Input to f, output to f. So the domain of f is going to become the range of g, and the range of f becomes the domain of g. It's like they switch places. All right? All right. So, I want to create some kind of an inverse function. Let's see if we can come up with a function that's going to undo f. And it's not really all that hard to do. We can do this just with common sense, or we can do this algebraically. I'll show you both ways. But just common sense-wise, if I were to put a number in for x, like we did 0, or like we checked with the 6, the first thing I did when I put a 6 in there is I took half of 6. So you can think of taking half of a number as dividing by 2. So the very first thing I did when I put that 6 into that function was cut that 6 in half. And half of 6 is the same thing as 6 divided by 2, which is 3. And then we subtracted 1, right? So let's go in order here. I divide it by 2, and then I subtracted 1. So and I could write divide by 2 and subtract 1, but this is the rule for f. So for instance, let me just pick a number like 10. Put 10 into this rule. Take 10, divide by 2, gives you 5. Subtract 1, gives you 4. So 10 should be sent to 4. Go ahead and look and see if you believe that 10 would be sent to 4. Is the point 10, 4 looking like it belongs on this graph? And I would hope you'd say yes, because all we have to do is go up 1 over 2 again, up 1 over 2 again, and we land on 10, 4 right over there someplace. So yeah, this is how we find our y values by putting x values through the function of f divided by 2 and subtracting 1. If I want to go backwards, i got to do the reverse. And I have to do the reverse in reverse order as well. The reverse of what I'm doing 
backwards as well. I think the best uh, analogy I can come on with, I can give you on this, is something like, uh, and this is going to sound kind of corny, but in the morning when you're getting dressed, you put your socks on and then you put your shoes on. So you do socks on and then you do your shoes on. This is how you get dressed in the morning. This is the order in which you do it. And at night when you're getting ready for bed or you're getting ready to take a shower or whatever it is you're going to do, you've got to undo this process. To undo this process, you don't put your shoes on again because your shoes are already on. You actually have to take your shoes off. And you want to take your socks off first. You've got to look at the last thing that was done and you need to undo it. That's the first thing in, the, in your process of the reverse cycle. So instead of putting your shoes on, you've got to take your shoes off. And then once your shoes are off, then you can take your socks off. So you're doing the opposite of what was being done, but you're also doing it in the reverse order in what it was done. So if you were dividing by two and then subtracting one, to reverse that order, you would have to add one first and then multiply by two. So if you add one first, add one to what? To whatever your input is. If you add one, that gives you an x plus one. And then if you multiply by two, you really have to say that whole thing gets multiplied by two. Then this gives you your inverse function. I like that too much. Too much thinking going on there. But let's compare it to our answer up here, to our original function. The original function had a half in it, and this has a 2 in it. Seems pretty logical that that would undo. This has a minus 1, this has a plus 1. Seems pretty logical that that would undo that. It's the parentheses thing that you don't quite know exactly where they go or what they do. Okay, so uh, it's really going to be nice for you to have an analytical method of, of getting this answer to pop out. However, we could just kind of test it a little bit. Let's go ahead and just like pick the number two and put a two in here for my x. What is two plus one? Three. And then you double that answer and you get six. And sure enough, if I want g to go backwards, I want the input to be a two for g. I want the output to be a six. And that nailed it. And you can test it again. You could try, what number could we try? Could Try 10? I'm hoping you're telling me no. You've got to try something over here in this set. So let's try a 4. Let's put a 4 in for our x instead of a 2. What's 4 plus 1? 5. And you double that and you get what? 10. Absolutely. 10 is going to be the answer for putting a 4 into the function of g. So we're going to have our g of x equals 2 parentheses x plus 1. And there's other ways you can write that. You could distribute the 2 and call it 2x plus 2, but then you won't see the plus 1 and the minus 1 working backwards with each other. So anyway, this is how you just, you know, common sense-wise create your function. But let me go ahead and give you a four-step process for determining the inverse function. And we're just going to ignore that bell and keep rolling. Okay. Alrighty. So I have four steps for finding the inverse function. Four steps. would be the original function's inverse. And we can call this f inverse of x. It's the same thing. All right. I actually like it when it's called f inverse because I know f and f inverses are, are f and f inverse are inverses. If you just give me f and g, I'm really not sure if they're inverses or not. So I'd have to do some tests for that, which we'll do in a minute as well. So four steps for calculating f inverse of x. Step one. ever 
given is y, you get your first step already done for you. It's pretty simple. That's a no-brainer. We all know that f of x and y mean the same thing. Step two. exactly what we're talking about with our socks and shoes. So I'm going to have to add one here to both sides of my equation to make this minus 1 disappear. It gives me x plus 1 equals 1 half y. I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by 2 to get rid of that 1 half. This gives me 2 times this whole equation, x plus this whole side of the equation, x plus 1 is equal to y. And I haven't solved for y yet because it doesn't say y equals, but it's going to say y equals 2 times x plus 1. And I think you can all guess what step 4 is. Step 4 is simply replace the y with our new symbol, f inverse x. So we have f inverse of x now equals 2 times simple. And we already have it right over here, which we just got through common sense of undoing whatever the function f was doing in the reverse order. So four steps for calculating the inverse function. I am going to ask you to give me these four steps, and I'm going to give you four lines on your quiz. And you are going to have to say, step one, replace your f of x with y. Step two, interchange your x and y. Step three, solve for y. Step four, replace your y with f inverse of x. And the very next question on your quiz is going to say, calculate the inverse function for f of x equals da 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 And if you've written the four steps above, you'd be hard put not to get full credit on the next question. So here we are with the inverse function. Now I'm going to erase this. You can backtrack it and watch it all over again. It should already be in your notes by this point. But I'm going to need this space here. This is how we calculate an inverse function. Done. Now, another set of directions is going to say verify that f of x equals 1 half x minus 1 and g of x, which is 2 times functions of each other. I'm just shortening it. Okay. So, I'm just going to say that if I gave you g of x and I gave you f of x, I want you to verify that f of x and g of x are inverse functions. In order to do that, verifying is like proving. Okay? You've got to go back to the definition of what inverse functions are, which we've already done before this video. But two functions are inverses of each other. If f of g of x brings you back to x, and g of f of x brings you back to x. So I need to show two things. I'm going to write that down. I need to show two things. The first thing is that f of g of x is going to bring me right back to x. 
So let's do it. F of g of x is equal to what goes under here? Let me see. g of x. Let's see. g of x is this. 2 times the quantity of x plus 1. 2 times the quantity of x plus 1. All I did was replace g of x with this function notation. 2 times x plus 1. And now I want to use the function f, and I want this whole oogie boogie to be my input. So the function f says 1 half of my input minus 1. This is 1 half of my input minus 1. And I'm hoping that this becomes x again, okay? All right, so what is this? What's my input? 2 times x plus 1, which is really weird. But I'm literally, I am embedding this function into this x, which is my f of x function getting f of g of x. So at this point in the game, you can do a lot of different things. I could divide off a half times two and just call that one, but I know most of you aren't going to do that. I know most of you are going to play inside the parentheses first and multiply through by two, so I'll mimic that, even though it's not, right, not exactly the fastest way to get the job done. But if I did one half and multiply this two through, this would give me two x plus two, and I can't forget my minus one. Now I have to bring the one half through the set of parentheses that is still there. And when I do this, what is one half of two x? Open your tell me one x. And a half of two is one, and then minus one. Remember, I'm hoping that this ends up being x. And now I have a plus one minus one. I'm thinking everybody sees this now. X equals x, and I'm good with that piece. I also need to show not only that f of g of x equals x, but that g of f of x brings me back to x. So now I need to take the function of f of x and use it as an input for that x right there in my function g. So this becomes g of what? f of x. And my f of x is this 1 half x minus 1. 1 half x minus 1. Now what does my function g do? g equals 2, open parentheses, x plus 1. So the input, this x right here, is going to be all of that function right in that spot. So 1 half x minus 1. So I'm going to simplify inside my parentheses. And this minus 1 and plus 1, they're going to spontaneously combust because they're opposites. This gives me 2 times 1 half x, and 2 times a half x is just x, and x equals x. And now that both of these things have been shown, I can say therefore f and g are inverses, or inverse functions, if you will. Matter of fact, I'll write functions this time. means that f is the inverse function of g, and g is the inverse function of f. So I have both things. Please make sure, if I say verify, that you go through these two things. If I say calculate the inverse function, then you go through the four-step process for calculating an inverse function. So it's all based on what it is I'm asking you to do. All right, now we're going to wrap this up just a little bit. we got another picture to draw over there. Of course, I have my f of x drawn. You must know that I now want to draw my g of x. So be careful. Give me a couple of points here on g of x. Let me just make sure we understand what's going on here. f of, f of negative 4 was equal to negative 3, and that meant that negative 4, negative 3 was on f. Isn't it going to be true now that g of negative 3 is going to be sent back here to negative 4 since we have our inverse function? g of negative 3 is going to be negative 4. 